You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this or they might turn out like us. Hi friends, I'm Johanna from a teeny tiny country called Austria. It was not always this tiny, but we downsized eventually. And I'm Annie from the third largest country in the world when we compare landmass. Yes, your whole country is almost as big as the whole European continent, I think. I know, it's huge. And the climates are so diverse. It's pretty amazing, really. Like if you look at New England compared to Key West, compared to Arizona, compared to the Pacific Northwest, just the diversity, it's pretty amazing. Whenever we had friends over from the US, they always loved our, you know, narrow winding streets in the city, uh, the old Gothic churches, and of course, all of our Burgen. <laughs> <laughs> we are always told that some places in Europe look just like straight out of a fairy tale. One of the reasons why we have those lovely narrow winding streets, which actually suck for traffic. Thank God <laughs> many places are on their way to ban cars from the inner cities now, which I highly appreciate. Uh, so why we have narrow streets and Burgen and cathedrals and all the other great fairy tale stuff is due to the so-called Mittelalter, the medieval times. And we thought after we usually prefer to talk about the Victorian era, the Edwardian era, and we had short excursions to the Habsburger Empire, why not tackle another historical theme, the medieval times? The medieval times. All the turkey you can eat for thirty nine ninety nine. Bring your own utensils. They will not be provided for you. <laughs> Promo code Fresh Hell. <laughs> Free napkins. <laughs> Do they not have utensils there? Do you have to eat with your hands? You know what? I think we went once when I was a little, little kid, but I, I don't remember. I just imagine everyone eating those turkey legs from Disney World. <laughs> like the My husband turkey legs. loves them. Loves, loves, loves them. <laughs> yeah. You can get them at the Topsfield Fair here. My husband usually gets a turkey leg and uh, street corn. <laughs> He's happy. But yeah, I don't know. Do, do they give you utensils? Someone will tell us. <laughs> so as I mentioned fairy tales before, I would love to do an episode where we just talk about the original fairy tales that uh, we over here grew up with and, uh, you know, compare it to the little bit, wat little bit watered down Disney versions. I think that might be an interesting Patreon topic. Oh yeah, that sounds like a great topic. I think people would like that. But today we thought it might be interesting to talk about torture in medieval times. People were just so creative when it came to torture. But first, you know how we roll, let's talk a little bit about the era that is usually referred to as medieval. So some people refer to this time as the Dark Ages, but that's not entirely correct. Medieval times or the Middle Ages lasted from the end of ancient times, so pretty much from the fall of the Western Roman Empire to the mid or end of the 15th century. Now, there are several events that are considered to mark the end of the Middle Ages, depending on who you ask. So it's either the invention of the modern letterpress with movable letters by Johannes Gutenberg in the 1450s, or it was the fall of Constantinople in 1453, or, you know, the time Columbus stumbled across the Americas by accident in 1492, about 500 years after Leif Erikson stumbled upon them. Others say the Middle Ages ended with the start of Luther's Reformation in 1517, or Maybe it was the German Peasants' War that lasted from 1524 to 1525. Whatever it was, we can say that the era referred to as Middle Ages lasted roughly from the beginning of the 6th century until the end of the 15th century. And it is divided into Early, High and Late Middle Ages. And the so-called Dark Ages were pretty much just the beginning of the Early Middle Ages because we don't have a lot of written sources from that time. So we are all a little bit in the dark on what was going on back then. But I know that many call the whole medieval period the Dark Ages because we think of a brutal, uneducated, unsanitary time, especially when we compare it to the antiquity, where we think of philosophers and poets and astronomers, you know, medical and sanitary advancements. So if we're all honest for a minute, then we can admit that when we think of Roman or Greek antiquity, we think of healthy bodies dressed in spotless white togas, and they all sit around in their marble cities listening to the greatest minds. And now we fast forward in your mind to the Middle Ages, and it's pretty much, I assume, in your head, dirty people without teeth, <laughs> but with a lot of scabs, followed by armies of rats spitting and peeing everywhere. Am I right? Is, <laughs> it's that what you're thinking about? I mean, that's pretty cliche, and some of it is true, but definitely not all of it. 
Yeah, for example, the idea that only people in medieval times were plagued by, well, the plague. Pandemics that are thought to maybe have been the Black Death tormented humanity in ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome as well. In Greece, the plague was believed to have been sent by contaminated arrows by Apollo, the god of war himself. But yeah, people in the Middle Ages, they had to endure a lot of diseases like the plague, cholera, typhoid, leprosy, smallpox, and so on. And not only were these diseases dangerous, pretty much everything back then could kill you. And we have a list of some of the most bizarre medieval deaths. Are you ready? All right. Bella I of Hungary died in 1063 when his wooden throne broke while he was sitting on it. It was a splinter thing that got infected. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know. Who can say? <laughs> uh, Philip of France died in 1131. He was taking a ride through Paris when a pig came storming out of the dung heap and scared the horse, as you do. And that caused the 15-year-old king to fall off his high horse. In 1184, the so-called latrine disaster of Erfurt took place. This one's pretty... um Okay, 60 people, mostly nobility, died when they were attending a meeting on the second floor of the St. Peter's Church in Erfurt. Their combined weight caused the floor to collapse, and they fell from the second floor to the first floor. But nope, they didn't end there. They went right through the first floor, collapsing that as well, and they fell into the latrines below, where they all drowned in excrement, which, that's a really shitty way to go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. In 1190, Mark Grave Dado III, also called Dado the Fat, died after an attempted cosmetic surgery. He had a doctor cut fat from his belly because he wanted to join Heinrich VI uh, on the warpath. I just can't imagine having a doctor at that time. It's shocking to me. That one is really shocking to me. How do you even have the idea, like, hey, he, doctor, come here, cut cut off this fat, I need to get in my old armor. Suit of arms, <laughs> yeah. It's, I don't, I, he must not have been mentally well, because you couldn't, anyway. All right, Charles II of Navarre, he was also called the evil one, and we were wondering how evil you have to be to earn that name at that time period. I, I'd say pretty evil. <laughs> like, pretty fucking evil, right? Like... <laughs> Ugh. So, yeah, he died in 1387. To cure an illness, he developed the habit of having himself rolled up in linen that had been soaked in alcohol. Again. <laughs> <laughs> What were they thinking? Who are these people? So one night, he's all wrapped up snug and tight like a mummy in alcohol-soaked blankets. <laughs> and a servant walked by with a torch and got a little bit too close. And the evil one himself went up in flames. It took him, oh, two weeks to die. So, okay, as a band name, we now can choose between the Flaming Ballerinas, but also Flaming <laughs> Royal Burrito. <laughs> God damn it, now I want a burrito. All right, I've got two more for you. So the King of Aragon, Martin I, died in 1410 from a fit of laughter in combination with some digestive problems. I have so many questions. Like, was this... <laughs> A fart <laughs> joke situation or something like that? I don't know, but apparently he laughed himself to death. He laughed for like three hours straight and then fucking fell right out of his chair dead. Which, there are worse ways to go. But yeah, he died without an heir, thus ending the House of Barcelona. And then last but not least, we have a death that some might be able to relate to. In 1478, George of York, the Duke of Clarence, who was a Plantagenet and so a distant relative of mine, was sentenced to death. And he was granted the ability to choose the way he would be executed. And he chose to be drowned in a barrel full of malvoisie. Honestly, we could and probably will one day do a whole episode on medieval diseases. I think we we should talk then in depth about the plague, especially in Vienna, or the dancing plague in 1518, or Jakutism. Mm -hmm. But today we want to talk about the ways people in the Middle Ages tortured their fellow humans. Now, first let's talk about what torture even is. 
Annie's friend Wikipedia says about the definition of torture, quote, Torture, from Latin tortus to twist to torment, is the act of deliberately inflicting severe physical or psychological suffering on someone by another as a punishment or in order to fulfill some desire of the torturer or force some action from the victim. Torture, by definition, is a knowing and intentional act. Deeds which unknowingly or negligently inflict suffering or pain without a specific intent to do so are not typically considered torture. The United Nations Conventions Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane or Degrading Treatment or Punishment defines torture in the following way, quote, For the purpose of this convention, the term torture means any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from him or a third person information or a confession, punishing him for an act he or a third person has committed or is suspected of having committed, or intimidating or coercing him or a third person or for any reason based on discrimination of any kind when such pain or suffering is inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or acquiescence of a public official or other person acting in an official capacity. It does not include pain or suffering arising only from inherent in or incidental to lawful sanctions, end quote. Might sound good, right? Okay. So, unfortunately, the UN excludes a whole bunch of types of torture. So, from Wikipedia, quote, This definition was restricted to apply only to nations and to government-sponsored torture and clearly limits the torture to that perpetrated directly or indirectly by those acting in an official capacity, such as government personnel, law enforcement personnel, medical personnel, military personnel, or politicians. It appears to exclude... 1. Torture perpetrated by gangs, hate groups, rebels, or terrorists who ignore national or international mandates. 2. Random violence during war. And 3. Punishment allowed by national laws, even if the punishment uses techniques similar to those used by torturers, such as mutilation, whipping, or corporal punishment when practiced as lawful punishment. Some professionals in the torture rehabilitation field believe that this definition is too restrictive and that the definition of politically motivated torture should be broadened to include all acts of organized violence. End quote. I think we can all agree that Amnesty International has a very broad definition of torture and therefore thankfully covers most of these horrendous acts. So, quote, torture is the systematic and deliberate infliction of acute pain by one person on another or on a third person in order to accomplish the purpose of the former against the will of the latter. End quote. And even though we want to talk about medieval torture, because let's face it, it's a little bit less painful to think about if there are several centuries between us and the torture mm. methods. But we shouldn't forget that torture is still used to this day, even though it is always illegal and against human rights. So from AmnestyInternational.org, they write, quote, under international law, torture and other forms of ill treatment are always illegal. They have been outlawed internationally for decades. To take just a couple of examples, 172 countries have adhered to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which prohibits torture and other forms of ill treatment, and 165 countries are party to the UN Convention Against Torture, which Amnesty International campaigned hard to create. But many states have failed to criminalize torture as a specific offense under their national laws, and governments around the world continue to defy international law by torturing people. Between January 2009 and May 2013, Amnesty International received reports of torture in 141 countries from every region of the world. Torture can never be justified. It is barbaric and inhumane and replaces the rule of law with terror. No one is safe when governments allow its use. End quote. It's very true. Yep. And if you think that torture nowadays is just done in some far away country with what we Western world would consider some corrupt or tyrannical government, then think again. Because Amnesty International found evidence of torture in over 79 countries, and I honestly think that there are probably way more. Oh yeah. Victims of torture have the right to seek asylum in other countries, but as modern day torture does not always leave visible marks, it is often very hard for the victims to prove their traumatic experiences. I think we don't have to talk in length about modern day torture. I'm sure we all heard about things like Abu Ghraib, uh, Guantanamo or similar cases from all over the world. But before we stop talking about modern day torture, I want you to know one last thing. 
I think it was in 2014 when Amnesty International did a global survey. Uh, more than 21,000 people from 21 countries were questioned. And we will link to the whole survey in our sources. It's very interesting. But the part that I want to tell you is the following numbers. 44% of all questioned people fear they would risk being tortured in police custody. This fear varies in the different countries. 80% in Brazil and 64 in Mexico fear being tortured in custody compared to 32 in the United States and 21% in Canada. These are very sad numbers. But what is also said that overall 36% of people that were questioned believe that torture is sometimes necessary. This belief also varies from country to country. Like in India and China, 74% thought the torture was sometimes necessary. That's the highest percentage among all the countries. In the US, it's 45% who think the torture is sometimes necessary. Let that sink in. So many people are scared of being tortured in custody, but they also think it's sometimes necessary. And you too might think now, well, sometimes torture is indeed necessary. And I totally get that. I, we all think of these incidents when criminals don't want to give up information that could save lives or something similar, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think the first season of 24 with Kiefer Sutherland, have I ever told you the story about the time I cried all over Kiefer Sutherland? No, you always just tease me with it. All right, I'll tell, I'll, that'll be my something good today then. But that TV show had so many of us, right, rooting for Jack Bauer to torture the evildoers and stop a terrorist attack. But that's TV and it's just not how things work in real life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And DNA tests come back in an hour. Yeah. Let's admit that's getting a little bit more realistic. But in 24, like most television, that's, that's not how things work in real life. And Amnesty International answers the age-old question, does torture work as follows? Quote, the use of torture destroys people, corrodes the rule of law, undermines the criminal justice system and erodes public trust in public institutions and the state they represent. It causes severe pain and suffering to victims which continues long after the acts of torture stop. And it doesn't work. Why torture doesn't work? A common myth about the torture is that sometimes it is the only way to get information that could save lives. States have a huge variety of ways to collect information on crimes, both past and planned, without losing their humanity. Torture is a primitive and blunt instrument for obtaining information. Around the world, torture is routinely used to extract confessions. Information obtained in this way is not reliable because people will say anything under torture, just to make the pain stop. They will say what they think the torturers want to hear, end quote. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. You get to the point with torture where you'll just say anything to get the pain to stop. I once, <laughs> I was once in the ER and I was scream begging a nurse to kill me so loudly that they had to come in and inject me with, I think, for said. I was scaring the other ER patients. And I don't have a low pain threshold. I had a hysterectomy in January and never needed an opioid. The surgical recovery was less painful than my usual abdominal pain. So to be in that level of pain where I, I legitimately was asking the nurse to just kill me. <laughs> yeah, I can absolutely see confessing to anything under the right circumstances. Yeah, I, I would have said anything to make that pain stop. So, all right, I think it's time to talk about what we're all here for, the absolutely macabre and horrible way that people were tortured in the Middle Ages. So, while torture was probably used for the first time in Persia around the 7th century BC, it was also well known in ancient Greek and Roman culture. It was used for interrogations, but at first only slaves were allowed to be tortured. And now hold on to your seats, because it looks as if slaves' testimony was only of any value if it was given under torture. The thought was that slaves could not be trusted and that they would never tell the truth without torture. Soon a few exceptions were added to the who can we torture please list, but it was mostly just for severe crimes like treason and the lower classes, who nobody cared about. Now in the Middle Ages, <laughs> everybody could come to enjoy a good torture, no matter what gender, no matter what social class, no matter how old you were. If they wanted to get more information on a crime, they would torture you. But it's not as if they could just torture whenever they wanted to. Oh no, they needed at least half proof of the guilt of the accused. At least half. That's mm -hmm. helpful, right? So like <laughs> just one person saying you did it? Is that... Maybe half a person. Just half a person. <laughs> 
So, yeah, if they thought you to be the culprit in a crime, or if you'd already been found guilty, they could torture you to get more details. Like, for example, what are the names of your accomplices? And you might not believe it, but the Christian church was absolutely against torture as a means for confessions. I think that still came from the time when Christianity was more of an underground cult, and future martyrs and saints were tortured by roasting them over open fire or, you know, throwing them into a pot full of scalding hot oil. But wouldn't you know it? The church changed their opinion on torture pretty soon, and on the 15th of May, 1252, Pope Innocent IV authorized the use of torture for interrogations of heretics with the issuing of the papal bull Ad Extrapanda. The church argued that it was okay to torture heretics as they were, quote, murderers of souls as well as robbers of God's sacraments and of the Christian faith. They are to be coerced as are thieves and bandits into confessing their errors and accusing others, although one must stop short of danger to life or limb. The bull also reads, when those adjudged guilty of heresy have been given up to the civil power by the bishop or his representative or the inquisition, the podesta or chief magistrate of the city shall take them at once and shall, within five days at the most, execute the laws made against them." End quote. But the bull also included some rules. I mentioned already the it must stop short of danger to life and limb part, meaning that people shouldn't die or have irreversible damage done to their bodies. Also, it was only allowed to be used once, theoretically. And last but not least, the inquisitor needed, again, some form of evidence that an accused was indeed guilty. So Annie mentioned the word inquisitor. Now, what's that? The Holy Inquisition was an institution of the Catholic Church that had the goal of fighting heresy. It was founded in the 12th century in France when dissent groups started to form. And in the beginning, the Inquisition used local clergy as interrogators and judges, but after the issuing of the Ad Extiopanda, it became common practice to hand choose members of the Dominican Order and mm, sometimes members of the Franciscan Order, but not as often, as Holy Inquisitors as part of their apostolate. So, at first the Holy Inquisition only, or mostly, dealt with heretics, people who wanted to split from the Catholic Church to form their own Christian groups. And pretty soon, almost every European country had the institution of the Holy Inquisition. Almost all European countries, except for England and Castile. So, when an inquisitional tribunal was held, a grand inquisitor usually was the head of the said tribunal, and he overlooked the whole inquisitional procedure. And in the second half of the 14th century, so we are now in the late Middle Ages, the inquisitor general of the inquisition in the crown of Aragon, so a mouthful of title, <laughs> <laughs> a man named Nicolas Eimerich wrote the so-called Directorium Inquisitorium, and in it he defines witchcraft, uh, he tells the inquisitors how witchcraft could be detected. He also included many texts that had been confiscated from sorcerers. And this book became the most important handbook for the Holy Inquisition and the Spanish Inquisition. Those lovely men who brought to you such famous things as the forced conversion or expulsion of Jews and Muslims in Spain and the witchcraft trials. Interestingly enough, Nicolas Eimerich had written, quote, interrogations via torture are misleading and futile, end quote. But yeah, you guess it, that didn't stop anyone. And honestly, I know we say that all the time, but we could do a whole episode about the Holy Inquisition as well and the Spanish Inquisition. And the witch trials. Oh, yeah. We might one day. I don't know. I'm sure Annie also wants to talk about Salem, right? Oh, God. Yeah. There's a <laughs> lot to unpack there. <laughs> it's so hard to not go into everything in detail as it is really all just so freaking interesting and fascinating. But we did mention the Holy Inquisition and torture trials in our episode 55 about Eva Faschaunerin, you know, the last victim of judicial torture in the Habsburg monarchy. And now it's time to take a quick break for our sponsors, Best Fiends. What's up, Hellions? Annie here, and I literally have to tell you about Best Fiends. It's the game everyone's talking about. I love it because it's the perfect break from my true crime research. It still really challenges my brain because it's a puzzle game, but it's a relaxing game, so it doesn't stress me out, which is perfect these days. And lately, we've been using it as a fun way to connect with our friends while still social distancing. There's a thread going on right now in our Facebook group where people are connecting to play against each other. It's pretty great. This awesome mobile game is five-star rated, 
updated with over 100 million downloads, thousands of fun levels, and tons of super cute characters to collect. There are also new in-game challenges and events every month, like the Wonderland theme Paint the Roses challenge happening now, so you'll never be bored. You can even play the game without using Wi-Fi. No bandwidth, no problem. Trust me, you don't want to miss out on this game. So join us and millions of other people who are already playing this fun puzzle game. Download Best Fiends for free on the Apple App Store or Google Play today. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. All right, so we know now that torture was used, but what methods were there? Yes, we're going to talk about the torture methods now. So, if you were the person of interest to the Spanish Inquisition, or maybe your local regent, what could you expect to happen to you? Let's start with one of the most infamous torture devices, the Iron Maiden. Not to be confused with the English heavy metal band. We actually had tickets to see them last year, but I had to send Paul without me. I was too sick to go. And it was a, it was a real bummer, but not as much of a bummer as the Iron Maiden. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. It's it's basically just like a human-shaped sarcophagus that would open like a cabinet, and the inside walls were just covered with metal spikes. So you would place the delinquent inside and then close the Iron Maiden, and the metal spikes would be driven into the body of the poor soul inside. And this would lead to a slow and rather painful bleeding out. Itchy too, I bet. Just <laughs> sounds awful. It really sounds awful, doesn't it? Ugh. It's horrible because I'm claustrophobic and I, I, I couldn't do it. I just... <laughs> I'm not claustrophobic, but I got to tell you, that doesn't sound good to anybody. <laughs> oh, no. And so the Iron Maiden, it's supposed to be one of the most notorious medieval torture devices, but there's just no real evidence that it was indeed used as a torture device in the Middle Ages. It's more of an 18th century myth based on the fact that people in medieval times were seen as uncivilized and cruel. So fake medieval Iron Maidens then started to pop up all over Europe and even made their way to the US. But the idea of devices similar to the Iron Maiden have been around forever. One description of a contraption similar to the Iron Maiden dates back to ancient Sparta. So the tyrant Nabus was said to own a, quote, fake wife modeled after his real wife, and it was covered in nails, which sounds like a Freudian nightmare. People who owed him money were then to be hugged by this mechanical wife. The Greek historian Polybius, who lived roughly 100 years after Nabus, spread a story about the mechanical wife, saying, quote, when the man offered her his hand, he made the woman rise from her chair and, taking her in his arms, drew her gradually to his bosom. Both her arms and hands, as well as her breasts, were covered with iron nails, so that when Nabus rested his hands on her back and then by means of certain springs drew his victim toward her, he made the man thus embraced say anything and everything. Indeed, by this means he killed a considerable number of those who denied him money." End quote. So, is any of that story true? Who can say? But it's a pretty creepy tale nonetheless. Now, the most famous model of a fake Iron Maiden was the one that was displayed in Nuremberg from 1802 onward, but it was destroyed during an Allied bombing. I always feel a little bit sad when we realize that something is just a myth and that there's not so much truth behind it. Oh, yeah. And that starts in childhood, doesn't <laughs> True. it? And I just, it never ends, does it? I think the thing that I like least about doing this podcast is how often I go in really excited to talk about a favorite topic, only to find out that once I do the more in-depth research, I kind of debunk and myth bust things that I used to really enjoy. <laughs> but most mostly debunks it. Mostly. Yeah, mostly. Yeah. Mostly. <laughs> okay, so next we have the saw that one's so much more real than the Iron Maiden, but it, this was less of a torture device and more of a style of execution because people usually didn't survive the saw. <laughs> so usually no. the delinquent would be hung upside down, which would make the blood rush down into the head, and then the executioners would slowly start to saw the hanging person in half, mostly mid sagittally starting between their legs. Oh. The fun is that because of all the blood in the victim's head, they would stay conscious for as long as possible, usually only passing out when the sore would reach their stomach area. But this method was way older, dating back to ancient Persia, and it was actually used all over the world. Egypt, Morocco, Russia, the Ottoman Empire, you name it, it's been there. The Roman Emperor Caligula had people not sought into mid sagittale but transversely. And in Morocco, for example, they would often start from the skull and then move into the groin area. 
direction. At least if they started in the skull, they'd be dead pretty quickly. Yeah, true. Also, a couple of Christian martyrs fell victim to this. So one of them, Simon, he is said to have been executioned in Persia, and he was hung up by his feet and sawed in half. Not Simon the Zealot. All right, so up next is another well-known one, the rack. So usually it works like this. The victim is lying in some kind of a rectangular wooden frame. His arms are tied, stretched out over his head, and his feet are tied to the other end. Then there's always some crank or turning wheel involved that's used to pull the ropes that are used to tie the arms and the legs, thus stretching the whole body of the unfortunate person lying on the rack. That actually sounds great right now, but just in like a (laughs) therapeutic... Oh, yeah. Sorry. So this could go as far, though, as ripping out limbs, which that's taking it too far. So, of course, like so many other torture devices, this also dates back to antiquity. Some of the earliest known mentioned uh, are from ancient Greece and, like, Pretty much all torture devices, this was also used on Christian martyrs like St. Vincent of Saragossa. It was reinvented by John Holland, the second Duke of Exeter, in 1447. He was the constable of the Tower of London, and the rack that was used in the tower is named the Duke of Exeter's daughter. That sounds like the beginning of a very dirty limerick. (laughs) It's the mother of all the nice rack jokes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, okay. okay. Now let's talk about the oh, spider. The spider's the no worst. No worries, it's not the creepy crawler that strikes fear in our arachnophobe hearts. It's a device that's also called the breast ripper. If a woman was found guilty of adultery or abortion, she would be tortured with this device. It was a metal claw-like tool. How can I describe it? Imagine giant iron tweezers with spikes at the ends. It could be heated and then the henchman would grab a woman's breast with it and shred or tear it. The iron spider was similar. The only difference was that it was attached to the ceiling or wall and the spider would be attached to one of the woman's breasts and then the woman would be pulled away from the wall until the breast would be ripped off. Ugh. I am really cringing at this one. That one is... Ugh. Yeah. So medieval torturers, they really loved iron. And not only did they use iron spiders, they also had iron chairs. It's pretty much a huge wooden chair that's just covered in spikes. The number of spikes can range from 500 to well over 1500, which I think we can all agree is too many spikes. I wonder who counted them all. I don't. It's the person sitting on them. <laughs> He had enough timing. <laughs> that would be my torture. It's like, sit on this chair, now count. <laughs> no. But yeah, it's just, it's too many spikes, especially when you're the one forced to sit on it. So oh. the victim would get tied down on the chair, which of course led to the spikes digging into the flesh of the person sitting there. If they struggled, it was painful by itself, but then they would get tied down even more. The good thing though, is that the iron chair was not deadly, mostly. Because sometimes the iron chair would have a stove-like thing under the seat so that the torturer could make a fire in it to heat the whole thing up. Interestingly enough, but not to anyone's surprise, the iron chair would often be used as a psychological torture device. It would just often be sufficient to bring the accused into the torture chamber and let them look at the chair. (laughs) Or if possible, they'd be forced to watch the torture of another person on the chair. But I guess that also goes for all of the torture methods. Yeah, I think watching any of these devices in action would be enough for most of us to confess to being, I don't know, D.B. Cooper and that you also kidnapped the Lindbergh baby. Right. But I think it's pretty clever to have somebody torture and the next person that you want to torture already watch that because it's like a torture one, get one free kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, so next we'd like to introduce you to the breaking wheel. In German, we have a saying, if you wake up after a horrible night and you feel tired and your body hurts and you had no rest at all during the night, then you say, ich fühle mich wie gerädert. So that means you feel like you've been wheeled. Oh, ich, one more time. Ich fühle mich wie gerädert. Ich fühle mich wie gerädert. 
I lost the last one, but I need to learn that. That's how I feel every morning. So (laughs) what does it mean? Well, this saying comes from the breaking wheel. This was not as much as a torture device, but actually execution method, just like the saw. The wheel was just that. It was a big ass wooden wheel with iron rims, just like you would find on, you know, big wooden carriages or covered wagons. You know, the ones that you would use to cross the prairie. You'll know what I'm talking about, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think everyone old enough to have played Oregon Trail knows what you mean. So <laughs> the children can figure it out. They can Wikipedia it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Trustworthy source of information. So the victim would be tied down with his limbs stretched out, and then they would take this heavy wheel and crash it down on the tied down person. This, of course, would break the bones, making the victim very mm, flexible. Then the person would be kind of woven into the wheel and then they would erect the wheel on a large pole and everyone could go watch that person slowly dying, like crucifixion style. The next device has a similar poetic name to the Duke of Exeter's daughter. It's called the Scavenger's Daughter. The German name is not nearly as intriguing. It's just called Storch, which means stork. Oh. Oh. Yeah. They should have called it like Turkey Vulture. <laughs> <laughs> something that's a scavenger. I don't know. I don't think storks are. They might be. I'm I'm pretty ignorant about storks. Okay. The scavenger's daughter comes yet again from someone working in the Tower of London. I think it must have been like, oh, a sadist dream, right? To have that job if you were had that inclination to work at the Tower. And it made people really creative. It was a really creative workplace, apparently. Yeah. It had a lot of freedom, creative freedom there. So a man named Sir Leonard Skevington, or Skeffington, uh, depending on the records you read, who invented it while he was the lieutenant of the tower under the reign of Henry VIII. So actually, it's a little bit debatable if we still count this as medieval torture, because it was very, very, very late Middle Ages or early modern period. It's Renaissance, at least, and it, it definitely needs to be mentioned, though. So the device we're talking about is it's either a hoop shape or an a shaped frame, sort of. And according to Wikipedia, quote, it was an A-frame shaped metal rack. The head was strapped to the top point of the A, the hands at the midpoint, and the legs at the lower spread ends. The frame could fold, swinging the head down and forcing the knees up into a sitting position, compressing the body so as to force the blood from the nose and the ears. The scavenger's daughter was conceived as the perfect complement to the Duke of Exeter's daughter, aka the rack because it worked according to the opposite principle by compressing the body rather than stretching it, end quote. So it just fucking squished you so much that you bled from your nose and your ears, which sounds horrific. But the beauty of the scavenger's daughter was that it was just so easy and inexpensive to make. So that's a bonus. But still, it seems as though it were actually a lesser used torture device. And of course, there is one on display in the Tower of London. Of course it is. It's probably next to the other tower child, the Duke of Exeter's daughter. And now I'm actually sad that we didn't tour the Tower Museum. Oh, it's good. We'll go when we do a show in London one day. Sounds like a plan to me. Okay, so now our next device is um, in the same league as the scavenger's daughter. It's rather from the early days of the modern era than the late days of the late Middle Ages. And it's called the Pair of Anguish. And am I the only one who thinks that sounds like something Count Rugen would use together with his life-sucking torture machine? (laughs) No, you're not. It really does. The pair of anguish. It does. It sounds ridiculous. (laughs) So the pair of anguish was the pear-shaped metal form, and it was made so that its elements could spread by using a turning screw. They did love those turning screws. Iron and turning screws. That was all the rage. So you would place it in the mouth, and you screw it open, and... First of all, that would be extremely uncomfortable, and it would make speaking and screaming very, very hard to uh, almost impossible, I think. And some think that this device was used mostly on women to punish them for things like blasphemy, witchcraft, and abortion. Yeah, it reminds me a bit of the 17th century scold bridle, right? So used to punish Mm -hmm. women who were talking too much. Yeah, we had them too. Uh, in German, they are called Schandmaske. Uh, but they were not only for women, they were used for all minor idiotic things that apparently had to be punished, like a metal mask with huge ears, for example, for people who eavesdropped. And then they would be placed on the pillory and everybody could come and laugh at them. So good times. Good times. That's <laughs> quality family fun time right there. 
<laughs> we also have the different devices to crush things. So there's like the head crusher, the knee crusher, and the thumb screws. These were all constructed pretty much the same way. Two metal plates and a handle that was used to tighten those plates. So you just put the body part you wanted to crush between the two plates and turn the handle to your satisfaction. Next, uh, the Spanish donkey or wooden horse. Uh, this was a wooden contraption looking pretty much like a wooden pommel horse or a gymnastic vault. But the part where you would sit on is not flat or rounded, but it's a very pointy triangle. And sometimes it could even have spikes on it. I hope you can all imagine what I'm trying to describe. The victim would be forced to sit on the pointy triangle part and their own body weight would pull you down. Of course, sometimes they would add extra weight to your legs. This device was most often but not exclusively used on women and we can only imagine how painful this must have been. People who had to ride the Spanish donkey often were crippled for life, unable to walk without pain ever again. Yeah, and I think that a variation on it was used as recently as the American Civil War. So last but not least, we have the Judas Cradle. MedievalChronicles.com describes the Judas Cradle as follows. The Judas Cradle consisted of a pyramid-shaped wooden device, and the victim was placed on the top of the pyramid. His or her hands and legs would be tied so that the weight could not be shifted elsewhere. The feet were actually tied with each other with the purpose of increasing the pain whenever there was a movement of feet. The pointed edge of the pyramid was slowly inserted into the anus or vagina of the victim, and the torture could continue from a few hours to entire days. The time, however, also varied from victim to victim depending on various factors other than their own ability to bear the pain. For instance, sometimes a weight was added to the victim's legs, which increased the pain but also resulted in a quick death. Other times, oil was put on the device, which again increased the pain. Various innovations were used to make the torture on a Judas Cradle more painful. To begin with, the device was never washed, which made it all the more dangerous and infectious. This meant that the victim could face deadly infections even if he or she managed to survive it. Among other methods, the victim was made to repeatedly fall on the pyramid to immensely increase the pain. The most common way to increase the pain, however, was to simply add weight to the legs of the victim. Sometimes the victim was raised with the ropes and given momentary respite, but this was not done out of mercy, but only to prolong the pain and misery of the victim. End quote. So, that's awful. I highly doubt that the other torture devices were cleaned in between torture. Yeah, I don't think anything was cleaned. <laughs> no. Nope. Mm -mm. Another variation of the Judas Cradle was the Judas Chair. This looked something like a bar stool, but instead of a place to sit, there was just a spiky pyramid. So the victim would have to squat on the stool, and once their muscles would weaken, they would fall down and impale themselves on the pyramid, which, oh, I just keep thinking of when you're a kid and you come off a bike. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know? Yeah, oh. exactly. Yeah. And that's, that's, I just, yeah, no. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm over here with my legs crossed, holding on to both too. my boobs. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, <laughs> yeah. All I right. look like I'm ready to go down a water slide. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That's it for the medieval torture. But I would like to mention one last torture and execution device, even though it is not medieval, but from ancient Greece. I want to mention it because it's just so damn elaborate and creative. It's the brazen bull. So this was a hollow bull shape made completely from bronze and it had a door on the side and you would put a person inside the bull and then close it and then make a fire under the bull, which, let's face it, would get super painful pretty quickly and rules the person inside to death. But that's not all. The device also had some form of acoustic system that allegedly would transform the screams of the person inside into bull sounds. Listen, if that's not entertainment for the whole family, I don't know what is. Right? The children love the bull. <laughs> What's not to love? All right, friends. That was terrible. So fascinating. Something good. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? However you like. Okay. Here's the Kiefer Sutherland story that I've mentioned, but never actually told the whole story, I think. So it was Christmas of 2005. My late husband, Adam, had died that August. And so my parents and my sister and I went over to England that December so that we could spend Christmas with his family. And we had brought over some of the ashes to scatter. That's actually another funny story, another time. So we were in Worcestershire for Christmas with my side of the family, Adam's family there. And and then we went with Adam's sister, Lucy, and her husband and did 
downtown London for a few days to do the museums and, and that kind of stuff. And so we were staying at the Strand Palace Hotel, which is on the Strand. It's right opposite the Savoy Theater and Hotel. But at the time, it was a really, we had a good deal to be there for like this Christmas package. So anyway, it's a nice hotel, but not, it's not the Savoy. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we're sitting in the lobby, and it was myself, my sister Moose, my sister Lucy, and my brother-in-law Ian, and we're sitting in the lobby waiting for my mom and dad to come down, and we're going to go into dinner. And all of a sudden, Lucy grabs my arm, and she says, oh my god, is that Kiefer Sutherland? And we all look up, and sure enough, it's Kiefer Sutherland, and he's checking into our hotel. And so Lucy's like, I'm going to go ask for his autograph. And I was like, oh, no, 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 I can't. And she's like, just come back me up. And I was like, fine. So Lucy goes and I'm walking with her. And then, of course, my sister and Ian are following us. And uh, he's checking in and they're running something, you know, his cards or whatever. And Lucy says to him, hi, you know, Mr. Sutherland, I just wanted to tell you I'm such a big fan. You know, could I get your autograph? And he's like, oh, of course, you know, what's your name? And so he writes, you know, to Lucy, you know, thanks for watching from Kiefer. Now I need to go back a little bit and say that Adam and I had just finished watching season one of 24, which kind of came up in this episode. And when he passed away, they had just started the previews for the second season. I know you'll understand what I'm talking about here, Johanna. It was one of these things where an ad would come on and I would just start crying because I was like, he's not going to see the next season, you know, mm -hmm. and it would be, yeah. And so it's fine. It's fine. I'm fine. I'm a big fan, whatever. We're walking over. He has a really nice, he has a really nice uh, hand knit scarf on. And I'm like, ugh, maybe I'll just say it's nice to meet you. I'd like to knit you a scarf and maybe have your babies. Because um, I was newly widowed. <laughs> I was back in the market, and um, so he signs Lucy's thing, and then he turns expectantly, just assuming, you know, I wasn't going to ask for anything because I'm not good at that stuff. And he looks at me, and I suddenly, I just burst into tears. And it is like I am ugly sobbing in the middle of the lobby, and everyone around us looks super uncomfortable. But now I'm really worried that Kiefer Sutherland is going to think that I'm crying because I'm like a super crazy fan. <laughs> that like cries. And so then I do the oversharing and over explaining thing that I'm incapable of not doing where I'm like, I'm so <laughs> sorry. It's just my husband, her, her brother, he died, you know, five months ago. And 24 was our favorite show. And he was, <laughs> I'm, I'm like ugly, ugly. There's, there's fluids coming out of all the places. And he just gave me the biggest hug. He just like mm. wrapped me up in a big bear hug and he smelled great and he was a really good hugger. And he wrote, like, dearest Annie, all my love, Kiefer. <laughs> so I got, and uh, later, I think that night, he got loaded and jumped onto a Christmas tree. Um, <laughs> but God love him. I'm sure he's listening now and he, he remembers you. I'm sure he's listening. I was the crazy <laughs> woman who cried all over you in December, <laughs> Christmas 2005. Uh, it was actually January. It was right after Christmas because we were there after New Year's. So January 2006. But yeah, he was lovely. He was so lovely. Shorter in person than I thought, but better looking in person. And um, really good hugger. Really nice person. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's my Kiefer Sutherland story. <laughs> I'm so glad that I finally got to hear the Kiefer Sutherland story. <laughs> I just thought I would be funny. You know, I'm walking over. I'm like, it's fine. I'll just be like, I love your scarf. Can I have your address? I'll make you one. <laughs> Let's have a baby. You're pretty. But it just didn't come out that way. Yeah. Okay. My something good is just a book and a movie recommendation. It's The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. Uh, the book as well as the movie fantastic. Oh, I've seen the film, but not read the book. And I haven't seen the film for forever. But I just I remember it was really good. For all of you out there who don't know, it's about solving a murder in a monastery in the late 13th century. So that's definitely something for uh, us crime aficionados. And it also paints a great picture of the Middle Ages. Uh, Umberto Eco, he was an Italian novelist. He died in 2016. And he also studied medieval aesthetics. So he knows what he's talking about. The movie stars Sean Connery, Christian Slater, and a very beloved Austrian actor, the late Helmut Qualtinger. So please go and check it out. Agreed. Yeah, that's a great movie. And I'm going to put it back on our watch list because it's been a really long time. So that's it. Thanks, everyone, very much for listening. This is the part of the episode where I, where I just beg, I just <laughs> beg you to please, please. leave. Please. Please. I mean, just the, the Kiva Sutherland story deserves 
five stars. <laughs> Let's face it. <laughs> my shame. My public humiliation. Oh, yeah. It's a good thing I have no shame to to lose. But yeah, it's uh, we, we really do appreciate it. It helps other people find the show and it makes our day when we read a new review. It, it really does. So and thanks. If you need a nice Facebook group where you can share uh, all spooky memes, house porn and photos of your pets that we all love and please say hi to them, then please come and join our Facebook group. You find it when you search for Fresh Hell Murder. It should pop right up. Yeah, it's a really great place. It's kind of the only place I go on the on the Facebook right now. Same. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a nice place to hang out. Yeah, thank you very much for listening. And as always, if you're going through help, keep going. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.